Okay, great. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, my name is Monique Sherritt. It's a French-Canadian name, so it's Monique instead of Monique, but I'll answer to both. And uh, one other housekeeping item, I use uh, video lecture capture. So if you are away this week or next, you'll be able to watch the lectures again. They'll all be posted on Blackboard at the end of the day, along with the slides. So the camera is that little, um, not the first blue light, but the back blue light. It's only filming me, so you don't have to worry about being captured on film. And uh, it's grabbing the slides as well. So the format for today's lecture, I'm going to uh, chat to you for about 45 minutes, explain the module and the assignments that we're going to do. Uh, Dr. Julie Shiro, who's here at the back, is going to be a guest speaker um, in the second part of this morning. We'll have our lunch, and then we'll come back and we'll do the first, uh, we'll do the first assignment together this afternoon. So getting started, welcome to digital marketing. Um, the focus for today is on how digital tools are changing the ways that businesses, brands, organizations, nonprofits, whatever we want to talk about, um, is changing the way that they do business, the way they communicate with their audience. And if we think about just our daily rituals, I, I'm sure that you can see how digital technology is already part of everything that you do. You probably pick up your phone the first thing in the morning or you use it as your alarm. You listen to Spotify or load a post to social media, Halo or My Taxi, a cab, text your friends, email, all of that happens now from a mobile device. And it's changed the way that we work and we do business and we communicate with each other. And it's crazy to me how quickly that has happened because if we look at some of these tools and technology they weren't they haven't been around that long so two years ago five years ago we didn't have some of the things that are part of those daily rituals google launched in 1998 doesn't seem all that long ago facebook 2004 youtube 2005 um, the iphone in ireland you didn't um we didn't have until spring of 2008 so it, you know, some of these things that had become habitual, the phones that we use, that technology and having a computer in our pocket is still, um, still a fairly new experience. Snapchat, everyone's favorite, 2011. And if we think even last summer, Facebook Live is our, is our newest thing that is um, creating interesting challenges for marketers to try and understand. Because for the, for the general public, for people, we adopt these technologies rather quickly and then the expectation is that they are part of part of business that businesses will communicate with us through these tools that we are readily using that are part of our ritualized behavior in the day and that's not necessarily the case in the business context we're still sort of struggling with how do we integrate social and mobile and what does that actually look like Did everyone see this video of Candace Pain, yeah, so regular mom posting to her friends, oh, 140 million views later. <laughs> uh, so that all happened in three days, right? It's really crazy how some of uh, these tools allow us to become broadcast centers, to have a wider audience than media or television channels or, you know, any, um, any celebrity, this is just a regular person. And so she ended up on every major talk show and it, it was just this really crazy thing. But that one example made it into Mary Maker's Internet Trends Report. Mary Maker is a venture capitalist, she does an Internet Trends Report every year and it captures the attention of people who are working in the technology space, in marketing, in business, because she's very good at honing in on what are the trends that are affecting us, not just individual consumers, but how do we need to think about that for business. So Candace uh, Payne's Chewbacca mask video made it into last summer's report because it had a significant impact on sales of that Chewbacca mask in particular from Kohl's, which is the store that she mentions twice in the video. So she's shortcutting this, like you think this is funny, here's, here's the store where you can go and get that. And so the trend that Mary Meeker is pointing out here is that the, the viewing magnitude of user-generated content is, is explosive. And we need to start watching things like Facebook Live. How is that going to affect 
broadcast media? How does that affect the advertising industry? What does that mean when regular consumers become influencers, trendsetters, and act as their own broadcast center? So we're living in this time of, of digital disruption where technological changes create these little ripple effects. And it's nothing new. If we go back to 1400s, the printing press changed the way that we think about reading and writing. It made it accessible um, to the everyday person. The telegraph and the telephone in the 1800s changed the way that we communicate, especially across long distances. Recorded media changed how we think about music, radio. It all became accessible within our home. And then the harnessing of broadcast media through television changed the ways that we started to think about how music and sound and images um, could all go together. And then we get that earliest glimpse of the internet in um, 1960 and the World Wide Web as we know it, um, as imagined by Tim Berners-Lee in, in 1990. And so those technological changes are interesting, those social revolutions that have happened um, alongside technology. And Clay Shirky uh, talks about this in his book, Here Comes Everybody. And he says that we're living in this fascinating time. And we can think about that in that, you know, nobody walked into the classroom today and was like, oh my gosh, lights, electricity. Right? We're, like, we expect that to be there. And we're at that stage where we sort of expect there to be free Wi-Fi everywhere. And we expect businesses to interact with us through whatever device or channel we are using. We expect that. But in terms of the business context and how we uh, figure that out, it's still, it's still a bit of a challenge to understand how do we integrate digital and social and mobile into what we're already doing. And there's this clear skills gap when it comes to digital and we see that in the Marketing Institute of Ireland and 256 Media in 2015 did the first survey in Ireland of content marketing and they looked at how that compares to international markets and content marketing is this core component of digital. It's all of the blog posts, the social media posts, the infographics, the ebooks, it's all of that content that we produce in order to attract people's attention and to acquire and retain customers. So it's this core component. And what they found was that 67% of Irish respondents um, reported have a, having a content marketing strategy in place. It's in comparison to 87% of the UK respondents. And when we look at the Irish market, there's 26% who have no strategy, six aren't even sure what that is. And so there's opportunities here for sure. Um, and it's one study, but we can see that we're kind of missing the mark um, across the board. If we look at the Digital Consumer Report, Digital Marketing Institute's uh, Digital Skills Study, so it's all telling us the same story, that we've got a bit of a lag here when it comes to digital. So we'll talk this morning about what makes an effective digital communication strategy. But I want to come back to this idea of the, these social revolutions because what's interesting with the internet revolution is it's a combination of all four of these previous revolutions in our social history. The, the technology that we have, internet technology, has changed the way that we read and write. It's made people into their own um, you know, publishers. It's changed the way we think about sound and music and technology and broadcast and streaming media, all these things. So when we, when we look at internet technology, it is this umbrella term for social media technology, mobile technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, some of the, the cool predictive analytics and things we'll look at later this week. So within this internet revolution, we've had four distinct phases. And Mark Schaefer, who's a, a social media consultant, talks about this. And in the late 90s, the priority for businesses when it came to the web was really just setting up a website. The purpose was to have an online presence. So websites were these kind of one to five page static brochure sites. There wasn't a whole lot you can do with them. You can still find these kind of sites. And then in the, in the late 90s, when Google launched, it just sort of changed it, it changed the way that we think about search. There were enough websites that we didn't just browse and wander around the internet. We actually needed to search for things. And so the way that Google changed uh, people's perspective about search was that 
for businesses, it meant we need to start thinking about search engine optimization. How do we actually get found? So the goal in, in this case wasn't just to have a presence, it was about discoverability. And we're today in this kind of social and mobile revolution where you know, businesses at this stage, the goal is to help and serve people at the point of need. When they're actually looking for us or trying to engage with us, um, asking questions about products and services, trying to come to our establishment, all of these types of, of questions, you know, looking for reviews, price comparisons, all these things that we do through our phone or, or computer. So the focus of our course is on social and mobile because that's where most businesses are today. They're trying to think about, well, how do we integrate these aspects? And um, Julie's here today to talk about keyword research and search because we want to understand this preceding revolution. Um, what, what impact does that have? Because each of these uh, changes in, in the web are built on each other. It doesn't replace each other. So we still need to understand having an online presence, discoverability, and we need to figure out social and mobile. And then we're going to look on Friday um, sort of forward at uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. I'm going to bring some cool um, toys for us to play with. And you know, the impact of those things haven't really been felt yet. If we talk about wearable technology like the Fitbit or Apple Watch, um, virtual reality, so the headsets, Oculus Rift, um, Samsung VR, or what you're probably more familiar with, augmented reality, the filters that we use in Snapchat are an example of that. Um, if you use Google Photo, example of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence, the way that it says, oh yeah, that's a, that's a photo of Neve, and here are other photos of Neve. It's freaky, right? Um, so we'll talk about all those kind of fun, fun trends. But the, the impact that these things that we, you know, are just on the cusp of really haven't been felt. Like, the, this technology is in the marketplace, but in terms of business and how we integrate it is not, um, you know, we're not there. We're just sitting on the edge of that revolution. And what people like Mary Meeker and technologists talk about is the impact that is still to come from machine learning and artificial intelligence and predictive analytics and big data and um, it's going to be this whole order of magnitude more disruptive than what we've seen today with mobile and social. So Mary Meeker in uh, her Internet Trends report says that in many ways we're just seeing the earliest impact of the internet and that is not evenly distributed across industries. The largest impact has been in the consumer market, but we have lags in education, health, and government. And so regulated industries like healthcare, um, you know, their integration of digital or, or mobile technology has been to create apps that let you scan your receipts and upload to your insurance company. Uh, they're not um, really social the way that consumer brands are. Government depends on the size of the institution, whether it's local governments, national, if it's the United Nations, depends on how sociable they are, the types of digital tools they use. And even in education, we're starting to see tablet use in classrooms, tools like Blackboard, electronic learning systems, video capture. Um, so, you know, the impact is not the same as what we've seen in the consumer market. And Deloitte does this um, annual report as well that gives us another look at that spread or the difference between adoption in various sectors. And they um, survey 10,000 respondents in 140 different countries. So uh, we're, we definitely have a significantly uh, sized data set. And what those respondents are saying is that the, the technical technological change is sort of increasing at this unprecedented rate and that it's really hard for them to keep up or understand what's happening. So that first curve you can see is um, technology innovation. The next curve is the adoption by consumers. Individuals just um, adopt more readily new tech, tech innovations. And then we've got that uh, gap between individuals and business. And what Duluth um, found was that in the U.S., 
uh, people are looking at their phones 8 billion times a day. And so that is really changing the way that different industries are trying to think about how they integrate mobile into that customer experience. So if we think about um, you know, media and what Netflix has done to disrupt the media industry. You can watch a whole video on your phone on an airplane. Couldn't do that a couple of years ago. Um, if we think about you know, transportation, Uber, um, my taxi, taxi, where you just, you're anywhere in the world and can grab, grab a cab. And um, even the restaurant industry is disrupted by things like Just Eats or Deliveroo. It changes the way that we think about engaging with, with these types of industries. And so that's difficult for companies that are still operating in kind of a status quo um, communication with their customers. The, the challenge that I see as being the, the most interesting thing to tackle is really the lag in public policy. So that's that final curve, and you can see how far behind um, the tech curve is and how far behind individuals are. So if we think about a pestle analysis or marketplace analysis, things like um, laws and public policy or politics around topics like minimum wage or trade tariffs, immigration, all of that changes after years of very slow public debate, um, environmental change, climate change. and when we think about augmented reality, virtual reality, big data, predictive analytics, the changes that are going to come through all the sensors that we have in devices that connect our home, our car, ourselves um, to the cloud, you know, we need really quickly some public <laughs> debate and policy on internet security, online privacy around the globe, what that means. Um, we need to start thinking about, you know, if the robots are going to come and take all our jobs and automation continues at the pace that it is, what does that mean for basic um, income? You know, what do we think about in terms of university programs and training people for a workforce that where, what is the job? Right? If it's automated and it's computer enhanced and we've got tools like IBM Watson that can predict and diagnose patient illness better than doctors, like what is that? We're not just talking blue collar factory jobs anymore. We're talking about higher intelligence cognitive um, thinking. So that lag in public policy is, um, is a real challenge. And the lag for businesses and, and organizations of all sizes, it is a challenge. So HR and recruitment managers are thinking about, well, what are the digital skills that we actually need to have? How do we, how do we uh, shorten or decrease that gap? And there are eight areas where we're going to focus on in our course. There's eight areas that um, you know, people are looking for in business. And so the written and visual content is really important. We have to get better at producing strategic pieces of content, not just one-off articles and constantly trying to find an audience for that. Um, we need to think about how do we create content that really nurtures an audience so that we engage with them, can leverage that audience. Social. Um, media and email marketing, we want to get better at actually distributing the content. So there's no build it and they will come. You post content, you actually have to go out and, and bring your audience to that piece of content. And on the right, we have performance tracking, operations, analytics, campaign performance, all the, all the steps that we go through in order to set goals and objectives to understand what we're going to do, how we're going to achieve um, that particular goal, and how do we actually track and measure performance in short, quick, iterative steps. So today, we are going to work on this writing assignment in the afternoon. It's a BuzzFeed style post that gives you um, some access to content management tools and thinking about how to use social media and mobile to create a, a bit of an outreach program for your piece of content. Tomorrow, we're going to start working in a group project on a brand audit and a strategy brief. So that's going to take us through some of the factors on the right-hand side of our grid. And Friday, we'll get into um, AR, VR, big data, all the kind of fun, cool, cool trends in, in marketing. For those of you who are away, again, the lecture captures will be available. Um, come and talk to me at the break, and we can figure out some of the, the deadlines. The lectures next week go into deeper areas around ad technology, um, paid advertising, marketing, automation. So we're going to cram a lot into the first three days and then um, go a bit deeper next week.
So I'll explain each of the assignments as we get to them, but all of the information, the module outline, the things we're going to look at each day are on Blackboard in um, the, the document, the module outline. We're going to look at trends, best practices, we'll talk about the omni-channel customer journey, the role that social and mobile plays in that path to purchase. We'll do some very practical assignments that um, will let you demonstrate and use um, more of the tools. And the, um, the, the, the content is all on Blackboard. If you haven't been using that tool, in the right-hand side, you're looking for the little tab that says lectures and resources. So you find all the, the PDFs of the assignments. In terms of the assessment, because people always like to have a, an overview of what's going to happen there, uh, we're going to participate in the Hootsuite student program. So this is a, a program that's available to university courses, and it gives you access to the Hootsuite um, social media management tools and a series of video tutorials that you'll go through in terms of engaging with prospects and managing contests and campaigns. And I know through your program, some of you have experience, more experience with social media than others. Um, the Hootsuite platform tool, it would be similar to things like TweetDeck or Buffer, but it has um, some enterprise features that are important to understand, and that's covered in the video tutorials. So you go through the tutorials, it's about an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and then you write the platform certification exam, and that is, you have 75 minutes to answer 65 multiple choice questions. I think you have to get 65% as a pass, um, and then you, you get this certification that you can add to your LinkedIn profile, you can put your um, name into their directory. So it's, it's useful to understand social media management, especially at the enterprise level, beyond some of the tools that you might be using. That um, program is free for us. I've applied um, for our class. So on Blackboard are a series of instructions for how you sign up for your account so that you can actually get that certification. Um, this component is going to be 16% of our of, uh, towards your grade. So what you'll do is take the exam, snapshot your results. You'll get a code, a verification, sort of proof of certification, which is what you can put on LinkedIn, and you'll also send to me through Blackboard. So that's the side of you know, managing content, stuff that you might be already familiar with. Um, if you're familiar with Hootsuite, you can just write the certification um, already or watch only the tutorials that, that you think apply. So managing content, the creating content side is our assignment we're going to start today. It's this BuzzFeed challenge where you're going to write a BuzzFeed article and try to get 1,000 views within one week. So it requires you to write some content and think about an audience and who the influencers in that category might be so that you can do some outreach to them in order to actually bump up the views of your particular article. So it gives you access to a content management system that would be similar to, say, a WordPress site or any other content management system for um, blogs or websites. And then you'll have to think about um, who can you actually do some outreach to, which is an important component of engaging with an audience. That assignment, I'll give you all the details this afternoon, but there is a PDF with the full instructions on Blackboard. You might want to have a look at it before our class this afternoon, but I will go through all the um, details. The group assignment, you'll work in groups of four, and you'll go through a brand audit, so you want to look and understand what content marketing they're doing today, what's working or not working. I have a bunch of tools that are free for you to use, which are very good for competitor analysis, but also give you a look at some of the analytic um, tools that businesses would have if they um, have Google Analytics installed or other web tracking, social media tracking. So you'll have a, a worksheet that you can go through for the audit, and then it's a four-page uh, strategy brief where you're going to decide, you know, what's the one social media network that this brand should be using better or more strategically, or the not using it at all and they should adopt it. So it um, is a look at the type of content in, in a more strategic way that they should be producing. So we'll cover that tomorrow, Friday, as I said, we'll um, get into AR, VR, uh, big data analytics and um, you'll have some time to work on each of these. So the topics this week, social media management, content management, SEO, um, augmented virtual reality, machine learning, big data. Next week, we're going to go deeper into ad technology, analytics, marketing, automation. 
in the module, you have some readings. They're not necessarily required readings, but if you feel like you need some background on each of these topics, they're good sort of baseline relevant content to read. And what we're going to do is try to cover some of these digital elements. Um, we're going for breadth, not depth, because what happens is that um, digital is such a broad category. What you want to do is actually decide what kind of job you would like and then go deeper. So we often talk about this as a T-shaped marketer. You want to know a little bit about all the things, and then you go deeper into the subject areas that are important to you. So if you are the kind of person that's very good at giving your friends recommendations, you think about you know, how to tailor what you're going to recommend to them, you like seeing trends or opportunities, those would be some of the jobs that are at the front of that funnel in the reach and convert stage. So things like um, you know, sales, uh, sales reps, account executives, people who are trying to get or acquire customers, understand the market, um, product managers. You'll see in that list for reach, act, and convert, there's lots of specialist roles, SEO manager, social media manager, e-commerce manager. If you're the kind of person who likes to be um, an expert in a field, to go really deep in a particular area, and you're a good coach or trainer or project manager, then some of the jobs around account management, um, you know, keeping and retaining the relationship, customer success, those would be roles um, where you kind of dig into more of the onboarding process. How do you train and educate your customers to um, adopt widely your tools quickly? Um, how do you help them continually see value? How do you encourage them to renew their contract with you? How do you upsell, cross-sell, resell? So if, you're, if you like you know, being an expert in things and helping people also develop some expertise, then that later part of the funnel. So it's kind of up to you. I'm going to give you the broad basics, and then you think about um, what areas of expertise you want to go deeper in. So I said we'd explore this question today, what makes an effective digital communication strategy? And this is a campaign that I like. It's called Missing Type. It launched in 2015 to raise awareness in the UK about the 40% drop in blood donors over the last decade. And the campaign involved social media, online, print, and it created a movement similar to, you're probably familiar with the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, in this case, it was uh, you know, likewise very easy for brands and individuals and organizations to get on board. And the basic premise was that you would remove from your name or your logo the letters A, B, and O, representing the blood types. And um, you know, we can't live in a world without A, B, and O. Likewise, can't live in a world without um, proper blood donation. So the big win for the campaign was that it resulted in 30,000 new um, blood donors registering in just 10 days. The campaign was a success. And in August of last year, the Irish Blood Transfusion Service joined 25 blood banks from around the world to launch Missing Type as a global campaign. This is 25 different blood services in 21 different countries covering a billion of the world's population involved in a call for request for new donors. So I'll just show you um, this little um, two-minute video from the media agency. It's really terrible background music, but it does explain the, um, the campaign well. And of course, now my audio is not working at all, which is good, because you don't want to hear the dirge music on this one. So this guy's talking about how the hashtag is trending on Twitter and um, how all of these um, you know, thousands of brands are participating. And then there's lots of personal stories about the importance of blood donation and the number of lives that it saved. They took out a uh, massive advertising in, uh, I think it was the independent, reached 600,000 different households. Here are all the people that participated.
So they had just massive audience size for this campaign, which is why they extended it into um, a global campaign. And the challenge of um, the challenge of the, the global campaign was that um, although they had well-known, recognized brands participate, um, it just it kind of missed the mark. So we'll talk about that. The the nonprofits like um, you know blood services or um, any 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 nonprofit that's looking for donations. As, as an organization, they kind of have two goals. They need to win supporters to their cause, and then they have to convert those supporters into actual donors. Social media and mobile are, are great tools for nonprofits to use. They're very easy um, sort of contests or campaigns that can, can be implemented, but there's a certain amount of slacktivism. It's easy to get people to like a post or say that they like um, a charity or a nonprofit. It's harder to turn those likes of support into actual donors. You can't, the same way in consumer marketing, you know, you can't just come out asking for money. The hard sell doesn't really work. So in terms of these social media campaigns, you need to have a really good, compelling story. It has to be shareable. You need to tap into some of the emotional motivations that your audience might have. So those kind of personal stories of people donating blood, the lives that were saved, people donating and then sharing on social media and participating in um, you know, using those hashtags or dropping the ABO letters from their name, all of that was Im important. It was easy for people to participate, which is why I like the premise of the campaign. The, the goal is really you're trying to get this disproportionate share of the conversation. You need to have that media attention and widespread participation from brands and individuals and especially from influencers. So, it was easy. It was easy for people to participate, especially in the UK campaign. It was easy for people to participate in the global campaign. But the, the initial UK one had this widespread media attention that just never caught hold in the other countries. And if we look at what happened here in Ireland, you know, the problem is like awareness. People always talk about, oh, social media is really great for awareness. We can't just have awareness without conversion. Right? There needs to be some action. There needs to be something that comes out of it. Um, and this is where the national campaign kind of faltered. What was really problematic is that brands participated, but they didn't necessarily have any call to action in their, um, in their messaging, or they weren't sort of coached or onboarded into, you know, here's how you participate in this global campaign. And if we look um, specifically at the Wild Atlantic post that is on the screen, I've explained this campaign to you. So you're going to read it and, and the context is there. Oh yeah, I see the letters are missing. But you want to imagine someone just sc scrolling through their newsfeed and they see you know, this particular post, what's missing? Yeah, the letters A is missing. Missing type as a hashtag. Yeah, it's like a fun word game. Right? There's no context in that particular post that this is a blo blood donation. They don't use a hashtag National Blood Week. They don't at mention uh, give blood underscore IE. Like there's no link to do anything. So it's just a fun word puzzle. Everybody does those. Oh, everyone's on board, right? So it's missing the, it's missing the context. In your um, BuzzFeed example that you're going to do today, you need to, you know, create some social media posts that promote your article. Tomorrow when you start the group project, you're going to assess a, another brand's social media account. So we want to understand what makes a good social post. And I've got some questions on the screen there that will help you kind of self-assess. So if we assess this Wild Atlantic um, post, the first question, is it going to attract attention and prompt action? Well, you know, yes, it's kind of an engaging image, it's a professional shot, it looks interesting, um, but there's no action, right? There's no call to action, there's no link. Um, yes, the hashtag is there, but is there any reason to actually click on it? You're probably just going to think, oh yeah, my brain has already answered the question, the A's are missing. Um, starting a post with a question is a good tactic. 
it gets our brain subconsciously, we just want to answer the question or fill in the blank. So that's a good tactic that they're using. Um, but the rest of the tweet is not really creating any momentum to do something. You read it and you scroll past. So we've got you know, some good elements for this particular um, social channel in place, but it's not great in that we're missing this clear call to action. So if we were going to rank it out of four, um, you know, four being an A, three being a B, you know, it's not, it's not an A. It's, it's got some originality, it's interesting, but it doesn't have all the elements. It's missing that call to action. It's not quite a three because, again, not all the relevant elements are included here. So it's kind of, you know, this is maybe like a, a C <laughs> if I was uh, grading it academically. So what I want you to do, um, because I know that we've got some varying levels of uh, social media in the class, I use a little tool called menti.com, which you can access from your phone or your laptop. So what I'd like you to do, either individually or in pairs, is just improve this post. Make it, make it better. And what will happen is we'll start to see, um, they'll appear as little word bubbles on the screen here. And it's anonymous, so you can. <laughs> Not have to worry, I will pick you up. Does it show you the original, or do I need to put it back up? It's, okay, good. Imagining that you're working for a wild Atlantic way, you have to do this pose for missing type. You've got that original one, but you just need to make it better.
So our first one's pretty good. It's got the same kind of word game, starting with a question, which is always good, gets people's attention. Um, it's vital for survival, so that's sort of peaking curiosity. What is that about? We've got some more context, give blood, so that's helpful. We're at least at a, at a B post now. So a similar, um, similar approach, we've got donate. It's always good to use a verb in, um, in your action, your call to action. We've got the at mention, so also helpful if we're participating or partnering with a brand, use their handle. Um, I like the, the here's a hint. Um, you can replace what's missing. That's a good, um, good approach. Very good. The links. We want to use a link. Um, the shortened links. Bitly allows us to conserve those character spaces. This is good. Only 3% of us give blood, so we can kind of use elements of, of guilt um, to, as, as emotional triggers to get people interested or, or involved. Sometimes that use of all caps can be effective just to help your post stand out. So this is also why the question marks are helpful or special characters within a post where you use you know, asterisks or, or anything like little arrows or pipes because our brain uh, spots numbers and special characters a lot faster. So it's good little uh, twigs um, to get our brain to pay attention to that post. So a special character would be the percentage as well. So, you know, good like straight up, we're supporting this cause. So it's all, it's all looking, um, you know, all of the, the examples are, are good, helpful examples that at least improve, um, improve the performance of that original one that we were looking at. Um, on Blackboard, I've loaded a template for you that has some of the most common formulas for structuring social posts. These are formulas that tend to work well. So as you had in your own examples, starting with a question, ending with a question, um, the short URL, you want to think about the placement of the URL. Often we put the URL at the end of a post. Sometimes when we A-B test that or, or think about conversion optimization and we track click-throughs, sometimes putting the link in the middle of the post is more effective. Same, we tend to put the hashtags at the end, sometimes in the middle can be more effective as well. So you've got this uh, long list of formulas that can help you think about posts. And when you're sharing or retweeting content, often you'll see commentary before the link. What a lot of social media experts do is they use some special character to donate or, or to indicate you know, this is my commentary and here's the actual tweet. So they'll use a little arrow symbol, a pipe, a star, something that, again, it's a special character that grabs our attention. So this question of what makes an effective strategy, we want to be uh, thinking about social media marketing in terms of the social and the media aspect not marketing, or at least marketing with a human voice, acting um, like we don't have our sales pitch hat on all the time. Because you want to think about social media as building relationships with your audience. We buy from people we know, like, and trust, which means, as Seth Godin says, you know, we're trying to convert strangers into friends. 
and friends into customers and customers into advocates. So it really is thinking more about how do we develop an audience? How do we understand their needs? How do we create content for them that is relevant and useful? So Starbucks does that with that little gesture of personalizing, putting your name on your cup. We can do that through elements of marketing automation that sort of personalize content, put your name into an email. That can come across as not genuine or uh, weird if you put strange um, names into those form fields when you're subscribing for things. But that idea of you know, humanizing the interaction, talking like a person, um, rather than you know, having your corporate speak on, you want to create these genuine relationships with your audience. Hilton Suggests does that. Um, it's their Twitter account that's run by Hilton Worldwide Hotels. They have over 11,000 followers. I took the screenshot a couple years ago because there was someone um, asking about a Dublin hotel. And the thing that they do, um, you know, Hilton's in the industry. So instead of putting the typical, you know, here are deals and accommodations and things to see, right? Like instead of just approaching Twitter the way that every other hotel does, they think about it as a digital concierge service. So we're going to answer questions um, for, from travelers. And we want to understand, well, what kind of traveler are you? Like, are you a budget traveler? Are you looking for a um, budget hotel in a good location? Do you have kids? Do you want to be near parks? Like, tell us more about you, and we'll suggest a hotel. It's not necessarily going to be a Hilton hotel. They're going to make a suggestion based on what they know and understand about that industry in that country, because they have hotels there. And why would they do that, right? Why would you recommend your competitor? Well, Hilton does that because they want to understand that traveler. They want to know more about what people are looking for in those particular cities so that they can adapt and change what they're doing. So they're using this kind of concierge service, helping people out, giving them suggestions that are valuable and relevant to them in order to use it as market research, business intelligence. And from the consumer side, you get this great recommendation and it all works out. You, you think positively about Hilton. So maybe like 11,000 other people, you follow the account to get really great tips about things to do in that area. Or maybe you consider a Hilton hotel next time you're traveling. Or you recommend to someone else a Hilton hotel or that they ask um, their question on Hilton Suggest because they've always got these great answers. So all of the interactions, all of the follower data, this is really useful to Hilton. They have through Twitter analytics and other tools that integrate um, with Twitter to be able to understand a lot of information about the demographics and interests of people who are engaging with them on that platform. So they're using it as, as market intelligence. And in uh, his book, Utility, Jay Bear says that we need to start thinking about digital marketing as, am I being useful to my audience? Am I helping versus selling? So if we approach how we create social media strategies with that mentality, how can I help my audience rather than pitch and sell my product, then this is how we build these audiences that we can actually engage with, that we can learn from, that we can develop better products and services for. So Hilton Suggests is doing that really well. And um, you, you can sort of see how this plays out in how individuals and brands approach these particular tools. So this is Instagram. Walter Ferguson is a Washington, D.C. realtor. And if you're kind of looking at his Instagram feed, you know, how would you describe his, his personality? He's obviously not a great photographer. Yeah, he's fun, right? Like he's making jokes about, oh, the Obamas are moving out. I wonder if I could, uh, what I could get for the White House. Um, he's got the sort of first home buyers mishap where they've put the shower rod inside of the shower nozzle instead of on the outside. Right, so he's kind of fun. He's fun, he's warm personality. Um, in comparison, what, how would you describe Michael's personality? <laughs> it's like it's, I've got the ring, I've got the body, I've got the... Yeah, so he's kind of like he's cold and, and slick, right? And if we even compare like the colors, the, the palette of colors in these two fees, Walter's using reds and warm kind of colors and tones and Michael's like cool, cool blue. 
They're probably both really great realtors. Um, depending on the type of home you're looking for, you may make a decision about um, you know, who you would gravitate towards. But the question to think about is, you know, if you're going to make a home purchase, you're going to buy the spend the most money ever in your lifetime, uh, you want someone who's going to be helpful to you, right? So based on this presentation of these two, who do you think is going to be more helpful to you? If you're just going based on personality. Which one? Yeah, the fun guy, right? Like, I'm a DM away Walter. Here are all these nice people that I've helped, right? Like, his, the presence or, or uh, you know, how he's presenting himself to potential clients is like, here are all these people that I've helped. Let me help you. Whereas, like, Michael's selling, right? Michael's selling homes. He's selling himself. So if you want someone to sell your house, maybe you want Michael. If you want to buy a house, maybe you want Walter. Right? There are these like small, subtle things that brands and individuals and influencers do through the images that they choose, the text that they choose, the tone of voice, the emotional triggers that they use in that content. So when you're evaluating your brand, you want to think about, are they, are they being as helpful as they could be? Are they presenting themselves as um, genuinely being interested in their audience? Or is this really like they're selling and pitching themselves? It, you want to think about that idea of building trust because you know we kind of think, oh, well, business to consumer, business to business, that the marketing tactics are different, um, especially when it comes to social media, but they're really not, right? What we're talking about is peer-to-peer -peer recommendations, peer-to-peer -peer engagement. I don't want to follow a nondescript, no personality brand. I'm going to follow someone where there's a clear personality, there's some sense of like, oh, there's a person behind this account. And B2B recommendations are phenomenally important, especially in um, our sort of those peer-to-peer -peer recommendations are especially important in B2B marketing. And B2B tends to lag further behind the consumer market in, in, in terms of how they integrate social and mobile. It's like, oh, well, that's just goofing around on social media and like posting what you had for breakfast. Our, um, you know, our buyers are, are serious and more important than that. But there's lots of tactics that the B2B market could pick up from consumer marketing marketing, especially in social. And what happens and what the research shows is that people who are in decision-making roles within B2B companies are 60% of the way decided before they ever interact with a salesperson or even the brand's website. So they're deciding, they're making purchase decisions based on the content that they see, on peer recommendations, a lot more on video, on content marketing, things that those brands are putting out there or that other people are talking about. So before you even have that interaction with a salesperson, you're, you're, the buyer's already decided. They know a lot more. We think about that with the auto industry, where people come into a showroom, they already know the car they want, they know all the special features, they know what the price should be. The same thing is happening in the B2B market. There's a lot of information and sharing among peers. So we want to think about, you know, how do we, how do we tap into that? How do we be a peer? How do we be a trusted resource? How do we build that relationship? And we want to understand this um, idea of the customer journey because there's different kinds of content that are going to work at each of the cognitive stages a buyer goes through. So Aida is that classic um, marketing model that you've probably heard of, created in uh, 1898 by an American CEO. And the idea was to help clients understand the role of advertising when ad agencies were really new. And we still tend to use this particular model to understand the cognitive steps that a buyer goes through. So you become aware of, of, of a product, you get more interested, you desire it, and then you, there's the action, right? The sale um, or the download or, or whatever that call to action is. And the problem with thinking and using this model from 1898 is that after the purchase, then what? 
right? Modern day marketing requires us to think about products as services, to sell services on a subscription basis. So renewal, repeat customers, customer loyalty, customer advocacy, all the ratings, reviews, and comments that people make about your products and service when they tell your peers, all of that's really important. So we need this extra step in the model that answers that what's next question, what happens post-transaction? How do we engage with these people after the purchase? And so uh, some marketers will add an S at the end, so they'll have the acronym AIDAS, and they're talking about satisfaction, the sort of emotional satisfaction that you have when something continues to be of value to you and, um, and it, it leads to that repeat purchase or advocacy. So AIDA is often replaced with this idea of the buyer's journey or customer journey or adoption process. There's all sorts of terms that get used interchangeably, but we're talking about the mental journey that the buyer goes through from awareness to consideration, decision, retention, advocacy. The other side of the coin is the sales funnel. What are we from the business side doing? what actions or marketing interactions um, coincide with each of those uh, steps in the journey. And thinking about it as a funnel is problematic because our decision-making processes are rarely linear. Um, there's, there's a lot of moving around, but it's still a helpful visualization to think about, okay, we're filtering our audience down. Um, we're interacting with them. We, as marketers, need to think about how we encourage people to move to that next stage. So the buyer's funnel, our, our buyer's journey is the perspective of the customer. The sales funnel is the perspective of the business. What, what do we, how good is the marketing at moving people along? Dave Shafi from Smart Insights has this kind of infographic that brings these two funnels together. Um, the other term you'll often see is the inbound marketing funnel. And so I like this infographic because he's kind of replaced AIDA with the race framework. So reach, act, convert, engage. The engage stage is that repeated actions advocacy stage, the what's next in AIDA, the satisfaction. Um, so this, this illustration is helpful in that you know it brings us a framework and it's got some information in the middle there about the buyer's journey, uh, the cognitive processes they're going to move through, and then the KPIs that are relevant for tracking what's happening at each of these stages. So I loaded onto Blackboard an Essential Marketing Models PDF that explains this particular model. We're going to keep coming back to it because it helpfully combines all these things that we want to talk about in terms of analytics. Right? So Google Analytics divides um, all of the reports into acquisition behavior and conversion in this case would be reach, act, and convert, right? So we want to start understanding what are, we, what are we doing to measure and track progress? Because sometimes when we're thinking, oh, you know, the campaign's not working or we're not getting a lot of um, contest entries or we're not getting downloads of this white paper or we're not getting a lot of sales and we talk about conversion optimization and we make the form better and we, you know, get trust symbols in there and we focus only on this section of the funnel, right? The problem might be that we're not actually creating enough awareness. Or maybe we're, we're creating awareness and we're bringing people to our, our page, but the, the landing page or the content around it or the advocacy, people who have made the purchase are not talking about it, right? Maybe there is some other problem at a different stage of the funnel. So it's a helpful visualization for thinking about our marketing. And on um, Blackboard in that module outline, you have a couple of readings that might be um, helpful for tomorrow. If you don't have a lot of time, the Kaushik reading, the see, think, do, care framework is really good. So Avinash Kaushik is a Google Analytics expert, um, and he's got this framework that matches nicely with the race framework, and he talks about the analytics for each stage and what we need to be thinking about in terms of combining you know, social and content and, um, and, and tracking that. So the common thread in all of these things before we take our break is the social and mobile aspect. Um, and I just, I can't express to you enough how important mobile is, especially when we start thinking about social media and email. What happens is we engage with all of these things on our mobile device. So we need to start thinking about websites that are mobile optimized. And like, you know, where's your phone, right? If you've ever had that panic moment of like, oh, oh, I don't actually know where my phone is. Or if I said to you, unlock your phone, pass it to your neighbor, 
We'd be like, yeah, I don't think so. Right? The phone has become this extension of our brain, the same way that the pen became an extension of our hand. So we need to stop thinking that social and mobile are these, are these distinct elements of a marketing campaign that we're going to develop independently from our communication strategy or our campaign strategy. Um, so I like that, that meme. And I also like this Google Consumer Barometer tool. If you missed it, I'll put it back there. So the Google um, Consumer Barometer tool allows you to do all this really fun, interesting audience research that looks across demographics or geographics at how people are using their phone. And what we see is that there's sort of this widespread adoption and that we're using multiple devices to complete a single task. So we're bumping around between looking at something on our computer, checking it on our phone later, maybe using a tablet. and that you know, that customer journey is a little bit confusing. Confusing for marketers, not for, for actually um, us as humans, right? Because how do you start tracking or understanding what offline behavior is having an impact on online purchase behavior? Or when is online impacting offline? So we've got these integrations that are happening. We talk about the multi-channel journey that people take. And even within digital, if you think about the activity that you have on your phone, you move between looking at an app, looking at email, going to a browser. Even if you're logged into each of those things, the analytics that we get kind of looks like this crazy grid. It's really not that nice, neat funnel. So tracking what's happening and understanding that flow becomes a challenge for marketing that we're going to um, start discussing. Because the real moment of success in your campaign is when, you're, when your audience member reaches for their phone to search for you. And they find your website, or they find your social media, or they find the ratings and reviews that are all about you. And it convinces them to, to carry forward with whatever the next step in that relationship is with you. And businesses are being disrupted by these types of enterprises like Uber, Netflix, you know, Deliveroo. We've got all of these changes that are happening in multiple industries because of brands or companies that understand that when, what you want when you want it moment. How do we deliver that? And how do we deliver that especially through a phone? So we are in this little cusp right at the edge of wearable um, technology and big data and analytics. And most businesses are kind of in this um, social media and mobile stage, trying to figure out you know, what they're doing there. We're going to go uh, after the break to talk about search our previous revolution, because that moment um, when your audience member reaches for their phone, Google always talks about these as micro moments. You've got this chance as a business to have produced content that is going to be relevant and useful when someone is looking for you. So the four kind of generic moments, I want to know, I want to go, I want to do, I want to buy. And those initial moments, those like, I want to know, they're just general knowledge. Like, I'm looking for information. I'm not in purchase mode. So there's distinct kinds of content that we can produce for that moment. The I want to, to go. You're trying to, you know, there's more intent. You're looking for best route directions, right? Those are good moments for brands to be creating content. When you're doing your audit, look at it on your phone, not just on a website. If someone was trying to go to this location, or call to make a reservation. Can they click on the link to the phone number? Does that work, right? Have they thought about the mobile moment? The um, how-to moments. We've got YouTube how-to video searches are increasing 70% year over year. And it's this moment before purchase or after purchase. I'm looking to figure out how to do something, or I want to see how to use this particular product. Again, great moments for brands to be thinking about creating content. And then the I want to buy. We have more and more people who are in store doing price comparisons or show rooming. So are we creating content that helps reinforce why you should buy it here and now? Does it create that kind of momentum? So we've got these four moments that are also helpful to think about in terms of the, the buyer journey. They are distinct phases uh, along the path. And we know that search is playing this ever important role in that purchase moment. So um, after our break, Julie's going to talk to us about search. Maybe we'll take a 10-minute break and then come back and I'll hand it over to her. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I too loud? No. OK. Good. Um, so my name is Julie Skiro. Uh, I am uh, 
assistant marketing prof here at the university, uh, teaching in uh, the MSc in marketing program and in digital marketing. And before we start, I just want to get an idea of your background a bit. So who has worked in digital marketing? OK. Um, who has experience doing keyword research? OK, good. That's, uh, that's good, because that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, so I really like this quote uh, from Theodore Levitt, which is, um, this is a, a famous marketing press professor from Harvard, who says, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want to buy a quarter inch hole. And I think that this distinction is really important. It's only become more important in the digital world, because when people are going online, when you're on Google, when you're on Bing, and you're typing things into the search box, you're looking to get something done, those moments that Monique just talked about. How do I, where do I, questions. They're jobs that people want to accomplish. And so when we think about keyword research, it's really about what kind of content should we be creating? So there's the very practical side of keyword research where you're uh, doing things with search engine optimization, um, you know, plugging in certain keywords in the headline and in the paragraphs, et cetera. Um, but what I'm going to focus on here today is actually choosing uh, what those keywords should even be. So this is kind of before you even do or, or create content, um, how should you decide what content to create, how to do that strategically. Um, so just so that we're on kind of the, the same page, um, this is a very general definition of positioning, and it has four parts. So good positioning will highlight when to use a product. So it's going to teach consumers something about uh, what your product is good for. Uh, the benefits that they're going to get, both tangible and intangible. Intangible might be you know, social signaling, um, these kinds of things and how the product is superior to competitors. Uh, so why should I pick your product over another? All via a compelling identity. So that's the personality. Now, what we're going to focus on here for keyword research is uh, that first part. So how to use or, or when to use uh, a product. That's going to be where really good content marketing comes in. Also, of course, in terms of uh, identity benefits, how you're superior, you can touch on all these things. Um, but a really strategic way to get new customers, people that don't know anything about your brand, um, that's going to be where good content marketing can really help you. So very basic, when I say keywords, this is what I'm talking about. So um, keywords are the words that people are typing into search engines. So Google, Bing, et cetera. Um, and so, and, and then the keywords that you use on your page. So just to give you a very quick background um, on kind of how keywords work in the Google search, uh, I want to show you this quick video. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into actually picking, picking keywords. Hi, my name is Matt Cutts. I'm an engineer in the quality group at Google, and I'd like to talk today about what happens when you do a web search. The first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, you aren't actually searching the web. You're searching Google's index of the web, or at least as much of it as we can find. We do this with software programs called spiders. Spiders start by fetching a few web pages, then they follow the links on those pages and fetch the pages they point to and follow all the links on those pages, and fetch the pages they link to, and so on, until we've indexed a pretty big chunk of the web. Many billions of pages stored across thousands of machines. Now, suppose I want to know how fast a cheetah can run. I type in my search, say, cheetah running speed, and hit return. Our software searches our index to find every page that includes those search terms. In this case, there are hundreds of thousands of possible results. 
How does Google decide which few documents I really want? By asking questions, more than 200 of them, like, how many times does this page contain your keywords? Do the words appear in the title? In the URL? Directly adjacent? Does the page include synonyms for those words? Is this page from a quality website, or is it low quality, even spammy? What is this page's page rank? That's a formula invented by our founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, that rates a web page's importance by looking at how many outside links point to it and how important those links are. Finally, we combine all those factors together to produce each page's overall score and send you back your search results about half a second after you submit your search. At Google, we take our commitment to delivering useful and impartial search results very seriously. We don't ever accept payment to add a site to our index, update it more often, or improve its ranking. Let's take a look at my search results. Each entry includes a title, a URL, and a snippet of text to help me decide whether this page is what I'm looking for. I also see links to similar pages, Google's most recent stored version of that page, and related searches that I might want to try next. And sometimes, along the right and at the top, I'll see ads. We take our advertising business very seriously as well, both our commitment to deliver the best possible audience for advertisers and to strive to only show ads that you really want to see. We're very careful to distinguish your ads from regular search results. And we won't show you any ads at all if we can't find any that we think will help you find the information you're looking for, which in this case, the Cheetah's top running speed is more than 60 miles an hour. Thanks for watching. I hope this made Google a little bit more understandable. Okay. Um, so you'll see he talks about uh, kind of SEO more, more generally, and that's something that I think Monique will get into a bit later. But he also mentions this idea of keywords. So um, Google goes around, indexes the web, stores all this information on, on each web page, and then when you do a search on Google, Google tries to decide whether or not your content is a good match. And one of the ways it does that is by looking at keywords. The words that are appearing in the heading of your article, the words that are appearing in the metadata, that's the description that shows up um, when you're on a search engine. Uh, the words in the URL, the words in the article, and Google has gotten more and more advanced over time with their algorithms. So it used to be uh, more of a direct match thing. Now that's not the case. Um, Google has a wide range of knowledge of, of relationships between words um, to help it understand context. So now it's not just about the keywords themselves, but also about synonyms and all of the words kind of surrounding, like what is this topic about? So if you've written an article and the first paragraph is on cheetah running speed and then the rest of the article is on, you know, payday loans or something like that. Um, Google's going to, to say this article isn't really about cheetahs. This is, you know, trying to sell you payday loans, for example. Um, okay. So I want to start this with an example. Who is familiar with the product Aura Brush, the Aura Brush tongue cleaner? Okay, two people, okay. Um, so this is a relatively new product. It's actually been around for a while, but it's gained popularity very recently. And what it is, is it's just a, um, it's like a tongue scraper, but it has these little bristly parts um, that get into the crevices of your tongue and get them really nice and clean. Now, they struggle a lot with their marketing. So uh, the founder of this company tried to get big retailers to pick up the product, uh, explaining why this is superior to uh, a, a, a basic tongue scraper, which can't get in the crevices. But it just never really gained traction um, until they made a YouTube video. All of a sudden, millions of views, they went viral, and now they're in stores all over the United States. So huge success. And one of the reasons it was such a success is because they did uh, such a good job in terms of, of, of keywords. 
That's one of the reasons. So let's think about this for a second. If you're Aura Brush, what keywords do you think are important to rank for? Give me some ideas and I'll pop them in here. Oops. What's that? Tongue. Okay. What's that? Clean. Okay. And remember, we can do long phrases, so um, oral hygiene. Oh dear, I don't know how to spell hygiene. Something like this. Bad breath, okay. Okay. What's that? Best toothbrush, okay. Tongue cleaner, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. How do I clean my tongue? How do I clean my tongue? Okay. Any other ones that people are, are really burning to get on here? What's that? Okay. Okay, great. So, you know, we're starting with kind of very specific uh, product level keywords and, and with brainstorming, we've kind of gotten a lot broader. So, uh, so this is good. If you think about the kinds of keywords that, that people are gonna be searching and the kind of volume that you can get from searchers. If you're just focusing on product-based keywords or even brand-based keywords, so for this example, things like tongue cleaner, tongue brush, or Aura brush, that's the actual brand, um, you're gonna have a lot less search volume on average because you're gonna miss everyone who doesn't know about your brand or doesn't know that tongue cleaners exist or that they even need a tongue cleaner, for example. Um, so strategic, keyword research and content marketing is gonna try and capture the top of the funnel. People that don't know about your brand, uh, that maybe don't even know about your product, but have some problem that they wanna solve that your product can solve. Um, so in this case, something like um, what I'm calling job-based keywords. So keywords that um, uh, answer some kind of problem like what is the job that people are trying to get done when they're searching in Google so things like how do I get rid of bad breath or how do you tell if you have bad breath or why does my breath stink for instance uh, so these are real problem-based things people aren't searching for uh, you know the solution maybe they don't even know the solution maybe they don't know that brushing your tongue can help with bad breath and so that's where you can come in and that's what Aura Brush did so they came out with this video 26 million views, um, and look at the title, Bad Breath Test, How to Tell When Your Breath Stinks. Okay, there's no mention of Aura Brush, there's no mention of Tongue Cleaner, it's just focused very broadly on a problem. So this is getting kind of, you know, when we talk about keyword research, we can't not talk about content marketing as well. And I'm gonna show you the video, and I want you guys to pay attention to uh, like how this content is created because what you're going to notice is that the whole concept of Aura Brush that comes way later that it's not it's not right away okay let's watch it Halitophobia, the irrational fear of bad breath. I'm a halitophobic. I'm not so much afraid of me having bad breath, I'm afraid of other people having bad breath. As in, hey buddy, your breath smells like crap! Maybe you should develop a case of halitophobia. Now I know what you're asking, how do we know if we have bad breath? You use this, you use a spoon. Now I know what you're thinking, a spoon, you eat with a spoon, you play spoons, you spoon your girlfriend? You take the spoon, and you take the spoon and you stick it at the back of your tongue and gently scrape. Let it dry and take a whiff. If it stinks, your breath stinks. 
And if your breath stinks, this is the only kind of spooning you're going to be getting. The smart viewer out there will know. To check your bad breath, you notice that we checked our tongue. 90% of bad breath comes from bacteria and residue on the tongue. On your tongue. Now your mom doesn't sound so stupid for telling you to brush your tongue. Now does she? Tongues are like sponges, soaking up all that bacteria. Toothbrushes are meant to clean the smooth surfaces of your teeth, not your tongue. And the tongue scraper? You remember the sponge, right? The tongue scraper just goes over the top of your tongue. This ain't gonna work. And mouthwash? This is like trying to clean your carpet with a hose. You're just watering down the problem. And then there's the option that actually works. This, the Aura Brush. The soft bristles feel great on your tongue. You just go back and forth a few times, then go all the way back, pull it forward, and see what comes off. It's the cure to bad breath. You can use this longer than your toothbrush. Use it in the morning, eliminate morning breath, fresh breath all day, yeah, yeah, and then use it at night, right before bed. Hmm? You know what I'm talking about, huh? So do you and me and the rest of mankind a favor, get one of these. And your Uncle Steve, the one who looks like he's got a thick coat of fur on his tongue? Get him one too. Put it in his Christmas stocking. He'll thank you for it later. His wife will, the kids will, everybody will be happier. Trust me. Get your first Aura Brush free at AuraBrush.com slash free. Okay. Um, so this video is doing a lot of things a lot of things right. So uh, one thing you'll notice is a uh, good call to action as soon as we introduce the product, buy or or get an Aura brush for free. At the end of the video, um, more calls to actions, a, a clear way to actually make the Aura brush yours. Um, another thing, if we think back to that definition of positioning, this video has actually covered all aspects, which is really, a ch really hard to do. Um, in a marketing communication is to actually address how to use the product, how you're better than, uh, how you're superior to competitors, uh, what your own personality is. Um, and I think that, that in this video he does that very well. He goes through, okay, this is why the toothbrush isn't going to work, this is why the tongue scraper isn't going to work, this is why mouthwash isn't going to work, um, and here's the, the option that actually works. Um, but the main reason that I love this example for keyword research is the, is the broad positioning of the video. So now when someone searches something like, how do, how do I know if my breath stinks, um, this video comes up. Um, and that gets a lot broader awareness than you would if you just had the title something like Aura Brush or, or, or Tongue Cleaner. And of course, more people are likely to watch your content when they think it's an entertaining piece of content versus an ad. So we see a lot of shift to advertainment um, in the digital landscape. So this is just an infographic that goes through um, the, the timeline. So this product was created in 2000. Uh, 2009, as a final ditch effort, Dr. Bob uh, contracted with a marketing student, actually the guy that you see in the video. Um, they spent $500 to create this YouTube ad, and all of a sudden, um, huge success. Millions of people discovering the product. Now there's demand for the product, so they can go to big retailers like Walmart and say, now there's demand, like how about now do you want to carry our product? And um, as you can see, now online sales are 40 plus countries, including 3,500 uh, Walmart, 7,000 CVSs. Okay. So how do we evaluate keywords? How do we know what's going to be something that people are, are searching for a lot? Is going to be the right way to kind of the, the broad level, the high level, which is what big topic should we go for? So in Aura Brush's case, you know, eliminating bad breath. And then more specifically, once we've decided on that broad topic, what is the best wording? What is the way that people are phrasing that search the most? So in order to do that, uh, you want to use tools. Uh, and these are just a couple of the tools that are available to do that. So Google Trends is great because it's, uh, it's free. Uh, then we have SEMrush, which gives you a lot of additional information. It'll give you search volume. It'll give you um, JPEGs of the ads that other competitors have run. It'll show you um, what websites are targeting the keywords that you're interested in. Um, Moz Keyword Explorer does, uh, gives you similar information. Now both of those second two are paid tools. Um, they both have free trials and they both let you do a couple searches a day for free. So 
This is Google Trends. And this is data from Google Trends. Um, and so what I wanted to do here was test different wordings of, of this query. So addressing bad breath. Now, all of the, um, everything's color coded. So you'll notice I tested how do I get rid of bad breath? Why does my breath stink? How to tell if you have bad breath? And then bad breath test is the one that they actually went with, okay? Um, now, in doing this, I actually found a phrase that the purple line, which I haven't showed you yet, which has a much higher volume, in fact, and that is bad breath cure. And so the interesting thing, as successful as they were, um, by switching out bad breath test with bad breath cure, they'd actually get a substantially higher uh, search volume. Now, in terms of interpreting Google Trends output, it's a little wonky. So that y-axis that's going from 0 to 100 is not search volume. It's just a relative metric. So um, from Google, the numbers represent search interest relative to the highest point on the chart for a given region in time. So a, va a value of 100 is peak popularity for the term. A value of 50 means that the term is half as popular. And a score of 0 means that the term was less than 1% as popular as the peak. So um, it's a bit confusing. Everything is relative on this graph. So all we can really discern from this, it's not telling us how many people are searching those terms. It's telling us relative to the other queries that you just put in and relative to itself, um, how popular is this search phrase. So what we're learning from, from this comparison is that bad breath cure is searched more often than the other ones. We don't know how, how often um, as an absolute figure, but uh, we know that it's more than the others. So we can use other tools um, like SEMrush or Moz Keyword Explorer, uh, which are designed to give you that additional information for money. Um, another thing to, uh, to keep in mind when you're using Google Trends, and I'm going to have you guys do an activity where you do this in a second, is how it interprets the words that you put in uh, into the box. So um, when you put in like tennis shoes, for example, um, it's not taking them in that exact order and only those words. It's assuming that it's going to give you results for any query that has those words in any order. If you want them to be specified in that exact order, only those words, you put it in quotations. Um, similarly, if you want to try uh, this word or this word, you can put uh, a plus. If you put a minus, uh, that suggests I want to exclude certain words from the search. Um, if you put, uh, yeah, okay, and we already covered plus is for or. So you might want to try different um, spellings or misspellings or plural versions, for instance. So that's just a, a reference. And I'll give you guys uh, access to these slides. Now, one thing to keep in mind is not to be afraid of what are called long tail keywords. So long tail keywords are defined as keywords that are greater than three words. Um, and so what this graph is showing you is that actually the majority of searches that are done on search engines are long tail. So that might be, you know, again, the, how do I do blah, blah, blah. Already, how do I do, that's four keywords, long tail queries. So 70% of all queries that are being done online are long tail queries, um, which is good because it means that, I mean, you have less volume, but it's easier to rank for a long tail than it is for what's called like a fat head word, like pizza. Lots of people want to rank for the word pizza, for example. And so instead of trying to rank for just that word, you can go for a longer tail version like pizza in, you know, Dunleary or, or, or something at least that's a little more specific. You get less volume, but you're going to get uh, a, better, a better match in terms of what you have to offer. And it'll be easier for you to rank. Okay, um, so going on Google Trends, trying to figure out what are going to be the best, uh, the best ways to word. Uh, the general topic that I've determined is, is going to be something that people care about, which is figuring out how to cure bad breath. Um, so I'm putting those up here in the job-based keyword area where I'm going to have the most, um, the most volume. Now, 
The next question you're going to ask is, well, who are we competing with for these keywords, and how hard are they going to be to rank for? So these are going to be important questions that are going to help you decide which phrasing is going to be the optimal one to go for. Um, so again, we're going to use tools to do that. So this is a screenshot from Moz Keyword Explorer, um, looking at the keyword, how do I get rid of bad breath? So a keyword can be, even though it's just a singular, it can mean an entire phrase. So how do I get rid of bad breath? Um, it's going to give me a couple metrics here. So it's going to tell me the volume. That's going to be how many people are searching on average per month. Uh, the difficulty, opportunity, potential, those are all algorithms that they've developed, and this is how they explain them. So the difficulty is a algorithm of the domain authority, page authority, and relevance. So domain authority and page authority are, again, other algorithms that they have um, that look at how popular a website is overall. So domain authority is, you know, if you're Amazon.com, that is a huge domain authority because uh, a lot of people are searching it, a lot of people know about it. Um, it's already ranked really highly in the search engines for many, many queries. So that's going to give you good domain authority. Page authority is about the page itself, so the extent to which um, pages that are ranking for that term um, are a good match for, for that query um, and have a lot of, um, you know, other good SEO practices, like other links pointing to them, for example, um, would increase the page authority of any given page. Opportunity is based on uh, the click-through rate of the current top 10 links. So that's when you're searching on Google, you have all your results, you're clicking through or not clicking through, that's the click-through rate. So whether or not you click out of the number of people that actually saw the links is going to be the click-through rate. And one of the reasons this is important is it's a signal of how well uh, the current hits are matching a query. So if, for instance, the top 10 links aren't getting a lot of clicks, that's suggesting that there's not a good match for that specific search term. So how do I get rid of bad breath, for example? Which means that you have more opportunity to craft a piece of content that's going to be a perfect match. And then potential is just a combination of all of those factors, of, of the difficulty, the volume, and the opportunity. Uh, so higher, higher opportunity, or sorry, higher potential is, is better. Um, and then this is how they're defining page authority and domain authority, so I just described that, but um, from them, so page authority link counts the number of websites that are pointing to you, significance of those links, so how popular are those pages that are endorsing you, trustworthiness, popularity, um, to a specific page, and domain authority is basically the same thing for the site as a whole. Okay, um, another thing to keep in mind is that these numbers are based on a logarithmic scale, uh, which means that it's easier to move up um, on the low end of the scale than it is to move up on the high end. So if you're seeing that the difficulty is something like 80, um, it's going to be much harder for you to go take that spot than it is if the difficulty was 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 lower, obviously. But the, the amount of effort that you would have to expend to go after um, something that was 80, much higher, because it's much more difficult as you get higher up. Um, okay, so here are some metrics for bad breath cure. Let's compare uh, these two. So immediately we see that bad breath cure has a much higher volume. Um, it has a bit more difficulty, but overall, Moz is telling us that the potential is higher, so a rating of 50 than more than 40. Um, now, of course, then this becomes like, how do you know, like, what's going to be the best mix? And that's really going to come down to your ability to, to look at all the options and think about it critically and analytically about, well, what's going to be the optimal, like, like what's the best mix? Like in, a, in an ideal world, you'd identify a keyword that has high relevance, high search volume, low competition, all these good things, but, but realistically you're not going to find that. Um, you're going to find keywords that are strong in some areas and weak in others. Um, so your best bet is to, to make a spreadsheet with all of your keywords that you're considering and look at the metrics, record the metrics, write some notes, and then make an analytical decision based on what seems like it's the most promising, all things considered. 
Okay, and don't be afraid of long tail, tail queries, even if the volume is low, if you can deliver high relevance. So what I mean by that is, if you can craft an article that very clearly um, addresses a certain query that people are typing into Google, then your ability to rank high for that is gonna go up. And we're gonna talk about uh, that in the very last portion of, of this talk, is creating comprehensive com content and how that can leapfrog you above other competitors that have maybe even higher page authority, domain authority, uh, higher popularity than you. This is some output from SEMrush, just to give you an idea of the kind of information you can get from there. Um, so I can look for um, various keywords. It's gonna give me the volume of those as well as the volume for related keywords. So that's just really good to give you some ideas maybe of some phrasings that you didn't think about yet. Um, and then another good thing to do is to just Google the keywords that you're thinking of anyways and look at what's coming up. Click into the links, look at what is the quality of this article. Uh, we're gonna talk about at the end how to assess the quality of, um, of a given hit um, to give you an idea of what you're competing against because your competitors are gonna be the top 10 hits on Google. Uh, a nice thing that SEM Rush will give you is ad copies. So this is uh, an amazing uh, feature, I think, of SEM Rush, where you, you enter in the keywords and it'll pull ads um, that just ran using these keywords. So you get an idea of, of who's going after these keywords in the paid section as well. Um, you can even look at how many ads each of these websites published per month. So you can see that amazingbreath.com, they published two ads on, on my keywords, I think um, for this one, maybe Bad Breath Cure or something like that. Um, About.com published some ads on, on Bad Breath stuff. So this is gonna just give you an idea of, of who you're competing with. And then you can actually click into them and look at exactly what ad. It's, it's referring to. So there's just so much information for you to go through and consider when you're making your decisions. And it's really great for, for brainstorming because what you can do is go through, look at the ad copy, uh, look at the keywords that they're going after, visit the websites of your competitors, maybe ones that you don't know about. So I didn't know about this amazingbreath.com <laughs> website, but it exists. Um, and I can click into amazingbreath.com on SEM Rush and then see all of the keywords that they're trying to rank for. So this gives you a lot of information on your, on your competitors. And they actually gave me some new ideas of ones that I, of words I hadn't thought of. Um, so to remind you, these are, the, these are the old words that I tested. Now, here are some new ones that I kind of stole from amazingbreath.com, and you can see that uh, it's very clear to me why they picked these words, because um, all these words are, 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 are very high above bad breath test, which is the original one that Ourobrush chose. Um, so this is, it's, it's an iterative process, right? You have your, you have a group of words that you think are good, you go and check them, you check the competitors, you get ideas from them, then you do the research again and you do this over and over again until you feel like you have um, a, a really good understanding of what's going to be the best uh, or, you know, keywords to use. Um, so I want to do an activity with you guys uh, so that you have practice actually using these tools and, and thinking about crafting content. So in terms of Aura Brush, you know, they crafted the content to appeal to this query. Do I have bad breath or not? Here's another product that I quite like, which is called Never Wet. Is anyone familiar with Never Wet? Okay. Okay, one person. Monique is familiar with Never Wet. Um, so I'm going to show you a video um, that went viral demonstrating the power of never wet. I mean, you're getting a pretty good um, idea with this GIF, but, but I'm gonna show you this one. This is Never Wet Arrives Hand on Product Demonstration. This has 13 million views. The foods you eat, it resists quite well. Sorry, let's 
is a two-part super hydrophobic coating. You spray a base, you give it about 15 minutes to dry, and then you spray a top coat on it. And after another 15 minutes or so, it's ready to go. It resists all sorts of waters, uh, aqueous solutions, salt solutions, acids, bases. Um, you know, most of the foods you eat, it resists quite well. Um, we have partnered in the last year with Rust-Oleum and they have brought all of their expertise to what we're doing as well, which has been tremendously helpful. And now we're launching across the United States. The outer section was treated with the coating. The center was just untreated glass. So when you put the water on it, the, water will, the colored water will stick to the uncoated glass, but it will not go out of that section onto the coated surface. I applied a couple thin layers of the base coat and allowed that to dry so it wasn't tacky and then I covered that with just a couple layers of the top coat. This is going to show that um, liquids won't stick and it's just easy cleanup. So we have a, an uncoated toilet brush and a coated toilet brush and we're going to see the difference. So if you're you know, cleaning your toilet, it would be great if things didn't stick to it after you were done. So uncoated one, you, know, you just clean things and uh, pretty drippy, kind of nasty. So, coated one will come out with no drips.